Morning, church. Um, today's teaching text is Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 to 23. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. At the end of the reading, I will say this is the word of the Lord, and you guys can respond, praise be to God. It reads as follows. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord of armies says. Ask the priests for a ruling. If a man is carrying consecrated meat in the fold of his garment and it touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, does it become holy? The priests answered, no. Then Haggai asked, if someone defiled by contact with the corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priest answered, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai replied, so is this people and so is this nation before me. This is the Lord's declaration. And so is every work of their hands. Even what they offer there is defiled. Now from this day on, think carefully. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? When someone came to the grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. I struck you, all the work of your hands, with blight, mildew, and hail. But you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. From this day on, think carefully. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? The wine, the fig, the pomegranate, the olive tree have not yet produced. But from this day, from this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. On that day, this is the Lord of this is the declaration of the Lord of the Lord of Armies. I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, my servant. This is the Lord's declaration, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of Armies. This is the word of the Lord. Let me ask you again: How was your week? More specifically, how did you spend your time? How did you spend your money? What did you talk about? Question, if someone who did not know you would look at your past week, would they see that you are a Christian? If so, why? Did you prioritize the kingdom of God this week? If so, how? Did you rely on God's power this week? If so, how? I believe that my questions this morning are justified by the book of Haggai, brothers and sisters. Haggai speaks into these things. And in today's teaching text, he preaches yet again. And he says to the Israelites that they should do God's work God's way. And that they should fix their eyes on the future while they are in the middle of the rubble and trouble of returning from exile with Zerubbabel. I just completed the little rhyme there. Tony Marira did it first. I didn't. There's our theme for today. Doing God's work God's way. Let's look at the book of Haggai because we're also finishing this sermon series. All the detail to be found on the map from the Bible Project. Uh, Lesejo has shown you this map before. I'm showing it to you again. A couple of quick ones. This is 520 B.C. 
after the Israelites returned from exile from Babylonia. That's your date, your stamp. It's a book of four sermons. Four sermons, four months. Power packed. All done by a guy named Haggai. You'll see the structure. We've got a sermon in chapter 1. Then we've got three sermons in chapter 2. Lesecho covered chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 over the past two weeks. Today we are covering two of Haggai's sermons in one. I know I preach long, but I will be able to preach one sermon about two sermons in the allotted or allocated time, if that's okay with you guys. Thanks, Lesecho, for giving us two really great weeks. I think he preached the absolute ripper both weeks in Haggai. And today we are turning our attention to chapter 2, verse 10, all the way through to 23. Question, how do we do God's work God's way? Because I can't tell you to do God's work God's way and then I don't help you to actually figure out how we do this. There you go. Three simple but very important answers. And I believe that this is a timely word for our congregation. Wholeheartedly, inside and out. That's how we do it. We do it by faithfully working and trusting God for the fruit. We do it with our eyes on the future. Let me pray for us before we start eating. Do you guys see what I did there? I used my metaphor of earlier. Yeah, yeah, stay with me, stay with me. Father God, we pray that you would revive us now by your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, our King, the ruler of everything. Do a deep work in us now so that we can be your body, so that we can worship you as King, so that our lives would speak that we are Christians. Help us to not be distracted. Help us to not create spin and pretend as if we have it all together. But give us a posture of humility to listen to what it is that you would want us to hear. We praise you that we can be together now in this moment, study this text, and eat it for all it's worth. We pray that your name be glorified. Amen. The prophet Haggai preaches two sermons in one day. Two sermons, one day. That's the last two sections of Haggai. He repeats some of the themes that he spoke about in chapter 1. I'm not going to repeat them because you can listen back to them on our YouTube channel or on our podcasts. And once again, the prophet, through these two sermons, is pressing into the way the Israelites are building the temple at the moment. They are doing it half-heartedly. They are doing it discouraged. They are doing it distracted. And then he makes the three points that I just showed you. And through that, he calls them to faithfully keep going in light of God's covenant with them and His future promises. Let's look at the first point. How do we do God's work God's way? We do it wholeheartedly, inside and out. I'm going to show you uh, the teaching text again, verses 10 to 17, and then you'll see, as always, I added my own highlights because those are the things that we'll be looking at. Before we jump in, quick sidebar. Let me explain to you what Lord of Armies means. Because I realize that we've been reading it through the whole book. That name is very common in the whole Old Testament, but I actually don't always know if people know what the name is. So in Hebrew, it's Yahweh Tzavaot. You can transcribe it as Yahweh Sebaot. If you want to, Sebaot, however you want to say it. It means the Lord of Armies. Here's what it means. According to ancient Israel, there were angels in heaven, in God's space. There is still angels in heaven today, are still angels in heaven today in God's space. Those angels send messages to people. Those angels are very, very strong. Those angels can fight, and those angels take commands. So the people in the time of Haggai, or the Israelites in the time of the Old Testament, understood God's space to be filled with angels, Divided into different armies, each with a commander, and then with one supreme commander. Who is? Yahweh, the God of Israel. So the Lord of armies literally means all the angel armies with their commanders, also called hosts. 
There's someone who they all report to and take their orders from, and that's only one God, and that is Yahweh, the God of Israel. So Yahweh, Tzavahot, means Lord of hosts. We sing that. Lord of armies. If you've ever read the message translation, you'll see that Eugene Peterson translates it as God of the angel armies. Do you realize on behalf of who Haggai is talking here? He's not talking on behalf of a weak God. He's talking on behalf of a God that has all power and authority over all power and authority in the heavenly realms that are way stronger than all the power and authority in the earthly realms. That's who he's talking on behalf of. Listen to the repetitions in Haggai. This is the Lord's declaration. Who? The Lord of armies. The strongest one there can ever be and will ever be. That's the one I'm talking on behalf of. Now, this is important for us to understand the name, and it's also important for us to see why Haggai used this name. Why did he use this name? Because other armies, first the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, and then the Persians, absolutely obliterated them. Once in Israel's history, they had a beautiful army, all unified under King David, this mighty general, an awesome warrior. It's gone. They are back in the promised land. They don't really have an army. They've got more like a neighborhood watch. Did you know what I mean? Their army is weak. It's small. It's non-existent. They got hurt by armies. And now Haggai says, I'm speaking on behalf of the Lord that is far mightier than any armies that might ever have hurt you or can hurt you or will hurt you. Phenomenal title, isn't it? I also spent five minutes on this now, which I didn't want to do, but I think it's really, really important. Let's look at verse 12 and 13. If a man, it's a question, and there's answer, no. And then again, if someone, then the answer is yes. Okay, so Haggai asks two questions, and he asks the priests to rule on this. Now, it might seem like a little riddle, but here's the main point. Haggai asks... Can you catch ceremonial holiness? Can it be caught? Can it be transferred by merely being close to it? And what's the answer? No. Look at verse 12. You can be in a church and not be a Christian. You can be part of a family that serves Jesus, that has phenomenal Christian values. It doesn't make you a Christian. You can go as far as going on a mission trip and telling people about Jesus. It's not going to make you holy. Why? Because it cannot be caught. It doesn't get transferred to you by just being close to it. And that's what Haggai says. Just because you are in the land, working on the temple, doesn't make you holy. Look at, uh, well, sorry, not look at, it's not on the slide. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Isaiah says, all of us have become like something unclean. All of us. Classic pastor's joke, listen to it, it's coming. All means all that all means. You know what all means. That's all that it means. You guys have heard that joke before. I had to make it. I'm a dad. I make dad jokes. I'm a pastor. I make pastor's jokes. Okay? All of us have become like something unclean. And all our righteous acts, listen, are like polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities, all the ways that we fall short, carry us away like the wind. You cannot catch holiness. Let me show you an illustration. This is mud, in case you're wondering. If you are a mountain bike enthusiast, that might call you into adventure. If you are a 4x4 enthusiast, you might go, piece of cake. That's mud. My hand is clean. I'm now going to take my clean hand, and I'm going to stick it into the mud. What's going to happen to my hand? And what is going to happen to the mud? Is the mud going to become clean because my hand's clean? But my clean hand's going to become dirty because the mud's dirty. That's the point that Agai's making. Listen, he says, clean doesn't make dirty clean. 
but dirty makes clean dirty. Do you guys see it? And then in verse 14, if we can just have the teaching text back, please, Rudolf. Here's a punch in the gut. So is this people. This nation before me. And so is every work of their hands. Even what they offer there is defiled. It's called a punch in the gut. Have you ever, have you ever had one? <coughs> oh, I feel winded. Might be because you fell. It's a punch in the gut right there. Why? Because this people, the people I guy's talking about, they were rebuilding the temple, but they had not reformed their lives. See, that's a problem. You can come here, you can sing all you want, you can pray all you want, and you can read your Bible all you want, if your life does not get reformed. Then you are defiled. And so is every work of your hands. Now people might feel like Haggai is being a little extra. I mean, I can see the people going, dude, hang on ya. We're trying, you know. Like, we're doing, we're doing what you're supposed to do. And I could also see Haggai answering them, I know, but that's not what God is after. You're getting it wrong. A prophet always has a strong word, guys. Don't be surprised by it. Haggai says this is God's work, and you should do it God's way. And God's way is being clean and pure inside and out. God is after more than only the do stuff. He wants all of us. Think about a kid clinging to a parent. You can take that kid off of you and put them down and tell them, listen, I do everything for you. The kid won't be satisfied. Why? Because the kid wants you. All of you. The whole time. We cannot satisfy this relationship by just telling them. It's the same in marriage. I can do as much as I want for my wife and she can do as much as she wants for me back. We want each other. All of us. It's the same with God. He says, I don't only want your do stuff. And then our guy says, think back about how it was when you were all into the do stuff. Let's look at verse 15 to 17. He says, Think carefully. What state were you in? And how did that work out for you? Do you realize that I had to strike you? I had to discipline you so that you can turn back to me. Do you want to go back there? That's what the prophet says to the people. You were frustrated because you kept on following your own ways. And because you kept on following your own ways and you didn't listen to me and you didn't repent, that was the reason for my discipline. We discipline our kids. I'm definitely not going to go into an argument with a six-year-old and a four-year-old. Oh, seven and five. Sorry. My bad. But do you know when I discipline them? I discipline them when they do not listen. I don't discipline them uh, at the first moment where they misbehave. We have conversations. I tell them exactly where the boundaries are. I also tell them what the consequences are. And then at some point I sit down and then I look them in the eye, or I pick them up to stand and look me in the eye, and I say to them, we have had this conversation before. You know exactly what you did. You know exactly what I want. You know exactly what the consequences are for your actions. And you told me that you'll stop doing it. But you didn't. And now we've got a real problem here. Because a spanking is coming up. I have this conversation with him. I struck you. It seems like you're not going to listen to me if I do not strike you. That's what God says to his people. Because they were paying him lip service. See, then I look my kids in the eye and I say to them, you say that you will change, but you do not. So your words are merely lip service. You are telling me and mommy what you think we want to hear. And then you carry on exactly like you want to. 
that's not going to work. It's going to stop here now. This is a hard word. But listen to it if you have ears this morning. Haggai didn't hold back. He said exactly what the Lord said to his people. That was a lot of bad news now. Let me give you some good news. Through Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, through his resurrection, through the pouring out of his Holy Spirit, this cycle was discontinued forever. Do you guys realize that? No more obedience to the law to make sure that God is pleased with me and that I am in unity with Him. No more, if I get the do stuff right, do I think I'm in right relationship with God. No more facing the consequences for our poor behavior that is against the law because Jesus paid it all. And that cycle now is broken. It is literally law versus grace. In the Old Testament, you had to get the law right. In the New Testament, you get the righteousness of God because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. You don't have to earn it. You'll never be able to pay it. He paid it all. God took His law from stone tablets and He wrote it on the hearts of His people. That's the new way we live now. You cannot tell me that you do, know, you do not know right from wrong because if the Holy Spirit is in you, He writes it on your heart. You have it right, yeah. And it's not written in Hebrew. It's written in a language that you can understand. Because through His Holy Spirit, He empowers us to be obedient. We can do this. We're not where they are. Something has happened in history. And that's the coming of the Messiah, the Savior. It's not in our own power. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not about outside, but it's about inside out. Do you guys see that? And that's how we do God's work, God's way. Wholeheartedly, all in, starting inside. And then it'll flow out. It's good news, brothers and sisters. It's good news. How do we do God's work, God's way? We do it by faithfully working and trusting God for the fruit. Faithfully working, and trusting God for the fruit. Verses 18 to 19, how many of you used the word granary this week? I didn't. It's a storehouse. It's a barn. I'm just saying. Like, Connie read it as if we use this word every day. Is there still seed left in the granary? I went, oh, dictionary. Oh, it's a storehouse. The barn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I get that. Here's what he says. Kenako. That's Hebrew for the time is now. <laughs> I'm joking. Kenako. Choose. That's what he says. Now, you've heard this before from another prophet. Let me show you. Moses. As the people entered the promised land. Wait. Nice one, Rudolf. Let me read the scripture first and then I'll show you a picture. This is Moses speaking, right before he takes the people into the promised land. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have said before you life and death. Today, Kenako, life and death. Choose. It's your choice. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Love the Lord your God, obey Him and remain faithful to Him for He is your life. And you will prolong your days as you live in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me show you a picture. Just a little parallel. So Moses, talking to the wilderness generation in Deuteronomy 30. We just read that. Saying to them, only true repentance and covenant faithfulness will lead to the coming of God's kingdom and blessing. That's the message. Obedience will lead to blessing, unfaithfulness will lead to ruin. The time is now, choose. And over here, we've got Haggai talking to the exiled generation with exactly the same message. 
So how do we do God's work God's way? We faithfully work. And then we trust Him for the blessing. Faithfully work. Listen, I didn't say you put everything in place to get the desired result. I said you faithfully work. And you read in Deuteronomy 30, that work is love the Lord your God, obey Him, and remain faithful to Him. That's what we are supposed to do. Do God's work God's way, and He'll do the blessing. Sidebar. Do you know that you are already blessed? Do you know that? We often take the mickey or have a stab at people using the hashtag, hashtag blessed. And the reason why we make fun of it is because they use it for the wrong reasons. If you are a Christian, here today, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You are blessed. Ephesians 1, verse 3, listen. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ? Do we believe this family? Because if you start here, every single day your life will radically change. If you get up in the morning and you take God's breath into your nostrils and you start with, I am blessed. Through Jesus Christ, I've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavens, in Him. I do not lack. And I can trust God with everything in me as I faithfully work and He brings the blessing. I'm telling you now that your life will change. Do we believe this? I'm looking at Leon now. Back in the day, Leon and I sat in a meeting one evening. And we were going around the table asking, so how are we doing, how are we doing, how are we doing? And Leon, I don't, know if you, I don't even know if you can remember this, but you said to the meeting, uh, we're doing well, we are blessed. That's what you said. And I remember that evening going, <laughs> it's a really short answer. Oh, he's right. <laughs> he is. And that was enough for him. Like, that's what he said. Everyone else was dishing about work and kids and economy. He went, yeah, we're blessed. See, that's where we need to be. Because you are. I know you've got a lot of stuff going on. I know life's not easy. You are blessed. And it'll end gloriously for all of us. Even though we might not see other forms of blessing now, we have already received the blessing in Christ, and that should be enough. In this church, according to this Bible, we believe Christ is enough. I can lose Everything I have. Christ is enough for me. It should be for you too. We are blessed in Him. I want to ask you again before I move to the third point and I'll round us up. Do you believe that God will bring the blessing if you faithfully keep working? Do you believe this? How do we do God's work God's way? We do it with our eyes on the future. Let's look at verses 20 to 23. This is a loaded passage. It's quite difficult to interpret. So take a deep breath. And then I'm going to finish us off. Right? We must remember when we read this passage, if we want to interpret it well, that Haggai was speaking with the end in mind, but from a very definite set of circumstances. Okay? There was a big difference in Haggai's world between the things as they were and the things as they would be. I mean, we've said this many times before, but let me just repeat it. Things then were small. It was difficult. It was discouraging. The temple was being restored, but it happened very slowly. The new structure and temple they built in no way matched the splendor of the former temple. Harvests were small. Drought and mildew plagued the workers. Zerubbabel uh, of the line of David wasn't a king. He was just a, Pers a, sorry, a Persian governor of a really tiny community. That was their 
circumstances. But, massive but, it would not always be that way. That's what the prophet Haggai says. He says Yahweh, this Lord of armies, was going to shake the nations. He would break their power. He would bring in their wealth to this new restored temple. And the future glory of that new and restored temple would be greater than the former. You can't see it now, but it will be. And that's God's declaration. That's His decree. And He says to Zerubbabel, who is God's servant, uh, that He would become God's authorized representative on the earth. Think of Exodus. This is all Exodus language. Do you guys remember the Exodus? I have done this before, says God, and I will do it again. I brought you from Egypt into the promised land. You disobeyed me and went into exile. And guess what? I brought you back from exile, back into the promised land again. And I will do it again. I don't need to prove anything to you, says God. That's my decree. That's my declaration. I will make this happen. That's what he says. None of these things happened in the lifetime of those who heard Haggai speak. None of it. Hard one. It would have been great if I would have told you, what an ending, what a season finale, what a two-hour special final episode. No, it didn't. The temple was finished in 516 BC. You can read about that in the book of Ezra, chapter 6, verse 15. The treasures of the nations were never brought to the temple in the way that Haggai describes it. The temple, after being renovated and expanded again into a really glorious state by Herod the Great, was destroyed in 70 AD. And that temple has never ever been rebuilt. That temple had a cornerstone, dear friends, of 380 tons. It was a ripper of a temple. It was Burnt to the ground in 70 AD. Quick Bible quiz. When do you read about Zerubbabel again? You don't. He disappears off the pages of history. In a few years, he's out of sight. No explanation of what happened to him. So question as we finish, was Haggai wrong? Was Haggai wrong? Because his words were not fulfilled in the way or within the time he expected it. The fulfillment of these words of Haggai was delayed for many centuries. But then, in the coming of Jesus, Haggai's hopes for the temple, that it would be greater than the former, and Haggai's hopes for Zerubbabel was fulfilled. Zerubbabel comes from the line of David. Jesus comes from the line of David. Zerubbabel was given the signet ring, right? The one who says, I can bring you guys out of this and out of his family. Jesus was born and he brought us into salvation and out of our sin and out of death and out of this destructive life. So it was fulfilled just way later than they hoped. Now, this new age that we live in, the age of the church and the spirit, has not yet reached its culmination. We know this. We live in this in-between time, right? So after resurrection, before restoration, the time of the church and the spirit and the great mission of God calling all people back to Him and the church sharing the good news, going to all nations and making disciples until in the end, everything will be restored. Everything will be redeemed. Everything will be made new. We do still see with our eyes and sometimes experience with our bodies the power of worldly kingdoms. The power of worldly kingdoms is still strong. But the outcome of history is sure. Do you believe this? It doesn't matter what pops up on your news feed. Do you know that a Christian can read their news feed going, Oh, this is interesting, doesn't change the end. Oh, this is fascinating, doesn't change the end. High inflation, high unemployment, civil uprising, diesel getting more expensive, food getting more expensive, this country is in a mesh. It doesn't change the end. We are still headed to the same future. 
So why be anxious about it? Why worry about it? I'm not saying that we don't have a role to play in it, but I'm not going to lose sleep tonight because uh, the interest rates were hiked and everything's getting more expensive. I'm going to feel the pinch in my wallet, but I don't care because the end is certain and it's sure. And that's the end. The declaration of the Lord of armies. That's the future we're headed to. And that's how we do God's work God's way. We do it wholeheartedly, inside and out. We do it by faithfully working and trusting God for the fruit. And we do it with our eyes on the future. Amen. Son, Marie, can I ask you to take your place behind the piano? And while you do that, I just want to ask you guys three questions. So we spoke about doing it wholeheartedly, inside and out. Let's take some time for reflection. What is the state of your heart? That's a great question. Lesecho and I sat in a discipleship conversation one day and he said, if your heart would be the front page of the Sunday newspaper today, what would be on the front page? And I went, oh, no, please don't put it on the front page. What's the state of your heart? You can start playing for us if you want. We spoke about faithfully working and trusting God for the fruit. Question, are you faithful and committed to the work of God's kingdom? My question is justified to you today because the scripture talks about it. Third question, we spoke about our eyes on the future. Simple question. Do you have hope? And do you have hope that will not disappoint you? Because hope in Christ and hope in the gospel will never, ever disappoint us. Father God, what we now sing is the desire of our hearts. And that is that you would be our vision. I pray that you would continue the work in us that you did in us now. I pray that you would settle us in our identity as your blessed children, redeemed and saved. And I pray that the next six days, if it is your will that you would add it to our calendars, would yield great fruit. We are faithfully going to work and we are going to trust you for the blessing. It's time now and we are making our decision. Praise be to you, Father God, the Lord of armies, the Supreme One. Amen.